Hi, this is Dr. Wooler for Great Plains Laboratory. This is another monthly installment of the complimentary webinars hosted by Great Plains Lab. And we're going to go through a few case studies tonight, as well as some other information on environmental toxicity, specifically with regards to the, the test from Great Plains called the GPL Tox Profile. I've been running this now more in my practice, and I'm blown away on what we're finding and what we're picking up. It's truly astonishing how much all of us really uh, are being exposed to a wide variety of chemicals. So what to do about them, you know, is things that we're going to learn about and some things that we'll certainly learn about as time goes on and working with this test because one of the things that will become important if you start running this test in your practice either if you're a practitioner or if you're a parent or an individual yourself who's just seeking to improve your health, it's going to be making sure to come back and repeat the test after a certain period of time. And I, I think minimally probably, you know, three months would be the minimum amount of time that I would look to retest. And then, you know, even sometimes a couple times over the year if you are actively involved in some type of detox program. So there is a ton of markers on the, G, you know, the GPL tox. I mean, in fact, there's over 170 markers for a wide variety of different chemicals. So they look at things like malathion and parathion, which fall into the category of herbicides, such as the organophosphates. Styrene and phthalates, you probably heard me mention phthalates before. If you've ever seen one of my presentations on the neurotransmitter section with regards to the organic acids test, because phthalates can inhibit the enzyme that helps to convert something called quinolinic acid. And so phthalates can actually increase quinolinic acid in the body, and that is a toxin to the brain and nervous system. Insecticides, benzene, xylene, you know, xylene, a whole host of things are picked up on this profile. I will often <clears throat> run the GPO tox in coordination with other labs. I mean, you know me, I love the organic acid test. I do a lot of lecturing about that. I teach a, a webinar on that. I have my own online courses where we incorporate the organic acid test information into things like adrenal function and GI problems, etc. But also the glyphosate test that Great Plains has is a wonderful complement to the GPL Tox. In fact, I would absolutely make sure if you're ordering the GPL talks to make sure that you also order the glyphosate test too. It's, it's that important. If you can order all three, then you're really going to get good insight into some different types of clinical uh, situations going on with the patients, clients, or even yourself. So let me go through a few examples of how the organic acid test sometimes can reveal problems that may be related to chemical exposure. It's not to say that all problems are, but that's where it um, falls upon us as practitioners to many times look deeper. One interesting thing on the GPL tox test is this marker called tiglyglycine. And tiglyglycine is a marker for mitochondrial disorders because what it's showing is mutations that are occurring within the mitochondrial DNA. And that can occur from infections, it can occur from chemicals and inflammation, and even nutritional deficiencies. And you'll see that from time to time show up. <clears throat> so here's lab example number one. So pretty typical looking oat right off the first page. We see, you know, a markedly elevated level of arabinose, and we also see a few bacterial markers. So, you know, pretty common. We do know that candida and some of the bacterial markers can interfere with mitochondrial function. And so this, this particular individual had a number of different markers that were high, indicating some dysfunction, if you will, in cellular metabolism with regards to glucose, as well as Krebs cycle and um, mitochondrial function overall. One thing to keep your eye on when it comes to organic acid testing as a clue, a potential clue, for chemical exposure is a high succinic. Now sometimes they might be slightly high, other times they'll be really high as we see in this example. Usually, and it's difficult to come up with absolute cutoffs as far as what's too high and what isn't too high, but generally for something like succinic, a level 
greater than 50 is indicating more of a significant mitochondrial problem. And this is marker is being looked at now as a pretty strong indicator of chemical exposure. So if you see it elevated, at least think chemical exposure could be a possibility. We also know that the organic acid test does an excellent job at looking at different byproducts of neurotransmitter function. So as we can see in this case, we've got elevated dopamine and elevated quinolinic acid, two things that are actually commonly high when it comes to uh, bacterial infections. One thing I'm going to point out in a little while, what, some of the chemicals like organophosphates can interfere with an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which can actually lead to an excess accumulation of acetylcholine. Too much acetylcholine in the body can actually cause a suppressive effect on other neurotransmitters like dopamine as well as <clears throat> reductions in serotonin. So keep that in mind. Hold on one sec. Okay. Also, CoQ10. This is a marker on the organic acid test under the nutritional section that indicates a deficiency of CoQ10. It's called 3-hydroxy-3-methylbutyric. And 3-hydroxy-3-methylbutyric is an indirect marker of glutathione, excuse me, not glutathione, of CoQ10 deficiency. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that CoQ10 is a major player in something called the electron transport chain. Uh, that's part of the mitochondria uh, function. And what it, the electron transport chain does is it produces a huge amount of ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, that cellular currency, that, that, that cell currency you know, energy chemical that our body needs to run detox, to run our brain, to run our immune system, etc. And as you can see here, it really fits in strongly throughout all different complexes, uh, primarily one, two, and three of the electron transport chain. Also, glutathione is a marker that can be picked up on the organic acid test. We can't say that all glutathione deficiencies are related to chemical exposure, but many are. So it, again, should be in the back of your mind that if you're seeing something like glutathione deficiency, that certainly chemical exposure may be at play. <clears throat> Transitioning to lab example two, this was from an individual that didn't have as many mitochondrial markers as the previous one. Even the succinic acid level was just mildly high. And the pyroglutamic marker indicating a glutathione deficiency wasn't significantly high. What was interesting in this case is there was no yeast, there was no cluster bacteria, there was no oxalates, there wasn't really anything else of significance going on except those markers. But when the GPL tox screen was done, this individual had very high levels of this parent compound called MTBE. We'll talk about these things shortly. This is um, a chemical that's added to gasoline to help improve octane readings. In fact, all of the GPL tox tests that I've seen, I'm trying to think if I've actually had one that was normal, I don't think so, of no matter where they were, anybody in the world, that marker is high. Some people are higher, but that particular marker seems to be high in almost everybody. He also had an elevated styrene, which can come from plastic manufacturings and even you know car exhaust fumes. And this actually was an individual that had lived in the city and then had eventually moved to a mountain town uh, to get away from the, the hustle and bustle of the city. So it makes sense that they'd have some type of exhaust fume exposure, etc. What was interesting is the triglycine marker was also high, indicating mitochondrial dysfunction. Again, we knew it wasn't coming from bacteria, yeast, oxalates, so sort of a, a common scenario of things off the oat. So chemical exposures um, certainly are a real possibility here. And the thing about triglycine is one of the things it'll do is it will inhibit 
this chemical reaction of what's called NADH to NAD <clears throat> and vice in, um, back and forth, this what's called a redox reaction. This chemical is critically important. Part of this chemical is actually produced through the Krebs cycle and it is very important as a initiator of electron transport chain biochemistry to produce ATP. So tiglyglycine, when it's elevated, um, indicates and will, will create problems in the mitochondria. And so and it you know, generally comes from the uh, chemical exposure. <clears throat> let's see if this thing's going to actually transition for me. Okay, so let's go through a few examples of just environmental chemicals. Pyrethrin is a chemical that is commonly found in garden sprays that people will use. It's also found in a lot of pet shampoos. So something to watch for because there was a one particular study back in 2008 that found that mothers who were exposed to pet shampoos tended to have two times, they were twice as likely to have a child with autism. And we know that pesticides exposures is a huge problem, really depending on where you live. Uh, I used to practice in California, would consult periodically the people that lived in the Central Valley of California, and they were just exposed to all kinds of different chemicals. <clears throat> this was a particular study out of 1998 that looked at pesticides exposed children in Mexico and what they found is that these kids had far less physical endurance um, than kids that didn't have the exposure. Okay, so jumping, you know, jumping up and down, etc. They also had uh, hand-eye coordination problems and they had very difficult times even drawing simple stick figures that the non-exposed kids could generally do fine. This was another study that looked at individuals in the Central Valley. Okay, so this was back in 2007. And what they found was, it's kind of similar to the, the previous study with the pyrethrins, but more than twice the risk of developing pervasive developmental disorder in kids who were exposed to organophosphates. And then the organochlorines, there was a seven times autism rate. They also looked at in some of these studies what's called pesticide drift, meaning that somebody who is, you might have your own organic uh, garden in your house and try to eat his best organic food. But if your neighbor on either side is spraying stuff on their lawn or their garden and it drifts into your yard, you can get exposed that way. I actually have this experience where I live. This was over the summer and I was walking out to get into my car and I saw this guy about two, it's about two houses up the street, was out in his flip-flops, his shorts and his t-shirt, no mask, Herbicide, whatever it was, and he was just spraying it up into his trees. And the thing was, you could see the stuff as he was spraying it; it was all drifting back down onto him. So here, I was thinking to myself: not only is that guy getting it all over himself, he's now going to go back into his home and get it on the kitchen counter and sit on the couch and, you know, grab the remote control to the TV set and contaminate that. One of the biggest challenges with chemical exposure, particularly in autism, is the ability to detoxify these pesticides. And it comes down to a specific enzyme called PON1. It's an enzyme activity that they've looked at. And they've noticed that the activity of this enzyme is much less in children with autism compared to others. Okay, so PON1. And it stands for peroxinase 1, and it's responsible for breaking down organophosphates. I know that Great Plains Lab is going to be looking to add the PON1 polymorphism to their SNP profile coming up sometime soon. I think it's early next year. And the interesting thing about this is that not only 
is this enzyme important for breaking down organophosphates, right? So it breaks down organophosphates from toxic compounds into less toxic metabolites. But it also has to deal with something called homocysteine thiolactone. And homocysteine thiolactone is a spontaneous reaction that occurs through the production of homocysteine. Homocysteine is part of the methylation cycle. When we have a deficiency of methylation, whether it's B12 or B6, etc., homocysteine can elevate. Well, some of it's going to spontaneously break down into homocysteine thiolactone. Well, it turns out that um, the, the peroxinase enzyme has to deal with it too. So another way of looking at it is poor methylation could potentially compromise the peroxinase enzyme function. So therefore, in the presence of organophosphates, there could be less of the ability to deal with those toxic compounds. Also, it's not only what's being going on in the outside world, it's what's going on in the inside world. This was just a paper that was looking at the association between indoor environments and autism rates. <clears throat> Smoking, okay, um, poor ventilation in homes, phthalate exposure, PVC exposure in the homes. I mean, you could extend this out, you know, from carpet cleaners to you know, cleaning solutions uh, that, you know, are, are applied to clothing or people clean their homes with. There's all different kinds of exposures, potentials that can cause problems in some people. Let me go through another series of labs here. And this actually is on a, a family. There's four individuals in this family that we're going to look at. There is one child with autism. There's one without, a little brother, and then mom and dad. And Realize they're all living in the same home, so they all have relatively the same exposure, although the parents may have a little bit different exposure depending on their jobs, etc. But generally they're relative they're eating the, the same relative same type of food. The parents control that. So but I want to point this out because it's interesting if you look at the when we look at the labs of how certain things are different, particularly with the autism child. So let's look at the brother's test first, okay? So here's that MTBE chemical, not extremely high in this particular case. Matter of fact, nothing on the first page that I would say is really, really high. The xylene is, is a bit elevated, and that may be coming from pesticides and paints, even fuel and exhaust fumes, okay? So that's kind of on average what I've seen with, with other individuals. <clears throat> These other compounds here from Things like benzene and diphenylphosphate, these were all relatively normal. As well as some of the other toxic metabolites, there's, a, there's a, uh, an acronym for a chemical called HEMA. This can come from you know, agrochemical detergents, from pharmaceuticals, from plastics and electronics. Overall, he was fine. Okay? So nothing to speak of as of yet. Not until we get to this chemical called 1,3-butadiene. And 1,3-butadiene is a chemical that's made from the processing of petroleum. It actually is a, it has a mild gasoline-like odor. And it's the, it's the chemical that's most commonly used in synthetic rubber. <clears throat> Here's the important aspect of it. A lot of the playing fields now, high school football fields, soccer fields, etc., these synthetic fields that many towns are moving towards, um, this is a, an exposure source. And in fact, this kid plays a lot of soccer. And so there's definitely very high exposure going on. But notice the herbicides, uh, organophosphates were all normal, and the triglycerin marker, for the most part, was normal. Okay, so and this is, by the way, the brother is neurotypical. If we look at dad, okay, dad is 63 years old. He has a very similar MTBE exposure. No health issues to really speak of. Okay, fairly similar levels to the styrene and the xylene can, you know, from his son. Interestingly, he does have an elevation of this ethylene oxide vinyl chloride. And 
perhaps it's coming through, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals, maybe personal care products, but difficult to say because the brother didn't have it. These other chemicals are normal. But he also had the elevation of that 1,3-butadiene. But he doesn't play soccer. Now, they do have a... Um, they do have some of this around the home. So many people actually have synthetic grass around their home as well. So, but there's clearly a large exposure there. Nothing to really speak of as far as the organophosphates. It's a little bit elevated here, uh, but certainly not as elevated compared to many other situations of really high exposure. So a little bit happening there. And, you know, dad is out of the house. He's not, you know, he may be out at restaurants, et cetera. So his exposure levels would tend to be a little bit different. If we look at mom's test, okay, again, the high MTBE, similar levels of the xylene and the styrene as her husband and neurotypical son. But she too also had that vinyl chloride ethylene oxide marker, very similar to her husband, but her son didn't have it. She also had the high level of the 1,3-butadiene. I'm actually finding many people with 1,3-butadiene, it's almost becoming as common as the MTBE marker of the gasoline additives. Organophosphates were lower, and actually hers were lower than her husband's. But if we look at the child with autism, things get a little bit different, okay? The MTBE marker, pretty similar to the rest of the family. The xylene marker, about on par with his brother, his mom, and his dad. The styrene level, much higher. Now remember, these can come from you know, car exhaust fumes, manufacturing of plastics, okay, food packaging. So that would be one thing you'd have to look at, is he being exposed to some type of food or special food, maybe that's coming in plastic that maybe the rest of the family isn't getting, or is he possibly just not detoxing it? Also, if it comes in plastics, a lot of kids who are very mouthy, right? They chew on things a lot, a lot of things in their mouth. That could certainly be an exposure risk there as well. Nothing to speak of much with these other chemicals, but notice this other chemical, diphenylphosphate. Is high. This is actually used in plastics again, so I'd probably come back and ask some questions about that. <clears throat> and it's used also as a fire retardant. So there may be you know, some exposure that's happening there as well. This can definitely cause you know, reproductive and developmental problems as well. But now things get you know, quite interesting. Okay, <clears throat> Very high levels of uh, something called acrylamide. This again is used in the process of plastics as food packagings, sometimes found in drinking water. Would we expect this to be coming from the drinking water? Probably not. He's just not able to detox it. Uh, cigarette smoke, nobody in the, in the family smokes. Okay, it's been found in things like potato chips and french fries, so I'd want to know a little bit more about diet, but for the most part, they all tend to eat a very similar diet. There's the 1,3-butadiene again. This boy doesn't play soccer, although he, he, he you know, is on the synthetic grass at home, so his levels are fairly high. <clears throat> fairly high. Okay, but look at the organophosphate marker. Look how elevated that is. Matter of fact, thought that his dad was somewhere in that just the 80th percentile, kind of in that yellow area, but he is much, much higher. And this is a family that really tries to watch what they eat. So again, exposure, but also that possibility of not detoxing. The other thing is really high is this other chemical called 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid, 2,4-D. This is a very common herbicide that was actually part of Agent Orange that was used in the Vietnam War. Extremely high here as well, okay? But again, not in the rest of the family. And also interestingly enough, is the tiglyglycine marker is normal for him. 
So his exposure is a little bit different, but also his ability to detox is also going to be more compromised. So MTBE toxicity is something that I think all of us are at risk for. If you drive in a you know, car, you're exposed to car fumes, chances are is your levels are going to be slightly high too. This lab actually came from a child where the family, when I found out, lived next door to a gas station. So um, the MTB is clearly known to cause respiratory problems and skin problems if, if there's exposure in that way. But it can also lead to nervous system toxicity and you know, kidney toxicity and liver toxicity as well. This one chemical, I mean, the best way is to try to avoid it. But where you can start to use things like glutathione and N-acetylcysteine to try to reduce or help induce the body ability to try to get rid of it. What about the 1,3-butadiene? Well, remember I mentioned that it is, comes from petroleum production as well as rubber or the production of synthetic rubber. So if you have kids that play sports, uh, there's a good chance they're going to be exposed to it. And <clears throat> most of the athletic fields now, I know my kids' high school football field is the exact same you know, synthetic field out there. There's a lot of them at playgrounds you know, as well. So there's always that you know, exposure risk. And one of the things that's been linked with this is increased cancer rates. In fact, um, they felt that people who play a lot of soccer, probably more, more so in the, in the college or the professional levels who've been playing for years, um, could have an increased you know, cancer risk. Another chemical is called perchlorate or por, uh, percolate. And <clears throat> this is, it's not something I see all that often. I didn't see it elevated actually in this family, but I've seen it from time to time. This came from a particular um, individual where there was some concern you know, with regards to thyroid function. And this is a chemical that actually is used in the production of rocket fuel. So <clears throat> it's been used in fertilizers and bleach, so it's used in a lot of other things too. So it can also come from food supply as well as water supply. The biggest thing with this is if you do find it elevated, look at the potential for you know, thyroid hormone uh, physiology issues. So if you are a practitioner working with somebody with a lot of thyroid problems, the GPL tox, this marker, could be a significant finding. The organophosphates, um, as we mentioned before, there's a lot of studies out there that look at farming communities, pesticide drift, how these things can affect. One interesting thing, as I mentioned, is these organophosphates interfere with the breakdown of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is very important in the nervous system. It's a neurotransmitter that's involved in a lot of different, um, you know, factors within the autonomic nervous system, but we don't want too much of it. In fact, the nervous system where the cells will actually produce an enzyme that will break it down. Okay, It's called acetylcholine esterase. And it will eventually break down and stop acetylcholine signal processing. But the organophosphates have a marked inhibition on acetylcholine function. And so therefore what ends up happening is you get too much acetylcholine uh, production, or another way of saying it is you get too much acetylcholine accumulation in the synapse, and then this over-representation of, of the, uh, the post-synapse getting overstimulated. And so these are just a series of slides to kind of give you an idea of what are some of the symptoms of acetylcholine. It's not to sit there and say that these symptoms only come from high acetylcholine, but <clears throat> it can be definitely involved in a lot of different types of situations. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read these things to you. I just want you to take a look at them. Weakness, cold-like symptoms, weakened immune system, a lot of emotional instability, depression, but what's interesting is that 
too much acetylcholine can lead to problems in brain neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. So in the presence of too much acetyl, uh, excuse me, organophosphates, where we know that it inhibits the acetylcholine esterase, enzyme that therefore can be an accumulation of too much acetylcholine, you could then be looking at a situation where these other brain neurotransmitters are low. And, you know, we commonly find that to be the case on some organic acids tests, right? The serotonin marker tends to be commonly low. Um, sometimes the dopamine or if the, the, neuro, the norepinephrine can be low. I, I'm not saying that in all cases it's coming from chemical exposure, but start considering this test to do as another way of assessing different problems. Okay, and so we talked a lot about the organophosphates, high levels of toxicity, uh, big problems within the nervous system, strongly correlated with autism. Um, the good news is shifting diet as well as doing some detox, you know, remedies like glutathione and acetylcysteine can certainly be helpful. But the first place is food. <clears throat> so we have to really improve the quality we really have to improve the quality of food, okay? Incorporating more organic food, particularly organic fruits. I mean, apples are heavily sprayed, grapes are heavily sprayed, strawberries are heavily sprayed. So you know, it costs a little more, but it's totally worth it from the reducing the chemical exposure and the accumulative nature that these things can have, particularly in people who don't detox real well, which is clearly the case with many kids on the spectrum. Hematoxicity is sort of this group. Uh, the biggest one is something called vinyl chloride. And vinyl chloride is used in a lot of different things, particularly things in like PVC piping. Okay, and so as you can see here, we have a level that is, you know, extremely high. It, uh, it can cause, you know, central nervous system depression. It can lead to things like headaches and dizziness. It can lead to liver damage and liver cancer over a prolonged period of time. There's an individual I was working with that I was highly suspicious that vinyl chloride, because in this, that, this test actually came from that person, that may have been causing something called thrombocytopenia, which is a, a blood platelet disorder. So reducing exposure also comes through improving the quality of diet, using filtered water, and you know things like sauna therapy, B12, glutathione, and acetylcysteine, et cetera. I don't fully expect these things to normalize in a couple of weeks. This is a this is a process over time. Many many months of active detox are, are often needed to you know really reduce the really high levels of some of these compounds. <clears throat> Two four dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. Okay, this is an herbicide that was part of Agent Orange again that was used in the Vietnam War. It definitely can cause a lot of nervous system issues, peripheral neuropathy, um, weakness, nausea, etc. It also disrupts certain endocrine function in the body as well. <clears throat> this is now something that is being combined with another chemical, which we'll talk about here, called glyphosate. And they're combining these two things as sort of a super, herb, you know, herbicide. You know, pesticide type of compound. <laughs> These things are detoxed out of the body, again through sauna therapy and antioxidants. This is not something I see as frequently as just you know straightforward organophosphates, but remember in that one autistic child, this was definitely elevated. So that's the GPL tox test, and there's other chemicals certainly as well. Let's just talk a little bit about glyphosate. And <clears throat> some things that I think are really important. There's a lot of press as far as glyphosate in autism rates. Okay, and there's a lot of these kind of charts that could be correlated in a lot of different ways with the increased rates of autism. But this is one of them, and I think a lot of these kids are extremely sensitive to these different compounds. Okay, this is not an uncommon marker to find on a child with autism who is consuming typically non-organic food and a lot of genetically modified 
food, probably the biggest player is corn. You know, corn and corn products are highly modified. Glyphosate is the main ingredient in Roundup. And what they're finding or have found is that glyphosate inhibits a plant enzyme called EPSP synthase. And this is what's needed by the plant to grow. So here's our EPSP synthase. <clears throat> so it produces this parent compound. This compound is then con converted over to something called chorismic acid, which then is fed into the tryptophan and tyrosine phenylalanine pathways. Well, where have you heard about that? Well, I mean, tryptophan is an important you know, amino acid for body metabolism. Tyrosine is used you know, as, an, as an energy chemical as well. In the human body, tyrosine is important for dopamine production and thyroid. Tryptophan is important for serotonin. Phenylalanine is in those pathways as well. So there's the potential of interfering with just, you know, overall amino acid metabolism in the gut. <clears throat> also, glyphosate disrupts the microbiome in the intestine. And what it does is it causes a, a, a ratio skewing where we start to get more opportunistic bacteria versus good bacteria and the propensity towards these highly pathogenic bacteria, certain strains of clostridia, etc. If you and this is one reason by the way, I always advocate doing the organic acid test is to be able to pick up on some of these other types of toxins. So one of the things we did with that family, and this is a simplified version, but you know, all organic food, filtered water. Okay, put them on, you know, uh, multivitamin, multimineral, antioxidant. I'm just listing some things here from New Beginnings Nutritionals because they have good products, but there's other companies out there um, that you know have good products as well. Felt it's important to do liver support, do some glutathione and some N acetylcysteine. Also, we implemented sauna therapy and implemented some electrolytes. Where the, uh, one of the things I'll use from the beginning sometimes is chelate mate. Um, I've had some of the people go to the local health food store and get some emergency packets, etc., that can be used. So just a, I mean, a general sort of all-around type of antioxidant, vitamin, mineral, liver support type of program. Infrared sauna is incredibly important as many of these chemicals are detoxed out of the body and can be detoxed out through the sweat, also mobilized by something called lipolysis. And these are much preferred than the external heat saunas that sometimes need very, very high heats in order to induce sweating. Not ideal for a lot of kids. Whereas the infrared saunas can generate heat and generate sweating at a much lower temperature, which means people can generally stay in the sauna for a longer period of time. These things help to increase microcirculation, and they also do something, as I mentioned, called lipolysis, which is to help break down fat, which mobilizes these toxins, because these toxins most of the time are getting stored in fat. And so this was just a, a typical or I guess you'd say an example of a program that we did. Now remember, <clears throat> this was being implemented primarily for a child, um, <clears throat> you know, about you know eight years old, and so we're not rushing it. These kids tend, you know, generally tend to be very sensitive to chemical changes. Um, we need to sort of build up slowly, etc and you know, build up our time and build up how many days we're going to do it over time. The other thing about doing sauna in kids is, and particularly special needs kids, is usually they're less tolerant to want to being cooped up in one space for very long. Um, <clears throat> I remember years, years past in a previous house that we lived in, we had a, a sauna. We still have it. And at that time, we tried to get our kids to go into it. Well, you know, they were in there five minutes, if that, and they wanted out because it was hot, it was uncomfortable, and they just didn't want to be there anymore. In adults, usually you can sort of deal with it a little bit better and sort of suffer through some of the uncomfortableness initially. So the idea here is to, you know, with the infrared saunas, by the way, you don't really need to have high heat. 
you know, sometimes even, you know, 105 to 110 degrees after eight to 10 minutes is enough to start to induce the sweating mechanism. In this particular child, they're, you know, they're about 25, 30 minutes in the sauna and then he's pretty much done. Um, and, and certainly over time, that amount of time can be built up. But the biggest thing is, <clears throat> is each protocol needs to be established based on the individual. So, um, and their own individual tolerance. The goal is to induce sweating, but not to get overheated, not to get dehydrated, not to come away from this in a worse off shape than when you started. So <clears throat> people need to make sure they're being hydrated, they're taking you know, electrolytes you know, prior, sometimes during, and certainly afterwards. Um, one of the things we recommend doing is showering after the sauna as well. And so what's happening, this is actually the whole family's involved um, in doing this too. <clears throat> there are some other resources with regards to sauna detox. Probably one of the most famous one is called the Hubbard Protocol. This comes from L. Ron Hubbard, who is the founder of Scientology. And you don't have to be a Scientologist to gain access to the information. And what they would often do is use niacin, um, the non, uh, not, not to use the non-flush, you're looking for the flushing niacin. That also helps to increase lipolysis as well as exercise prior. And in some of the old hover protocol information, people were doing you know, some of the sauna therapies upwards of five hours a day. And they'd often do you know, exercise prior to kind of get the sweating mechanism going. I think that's a good idea. It's not something that I've done typically with a lot of the special needs kids, but with adult patients, that certainly could be done. With the infrared saunas, the, um, the need to stay in there for five hours just isn't there. The, 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 the effect of sweating is induced much more quickly. And so, you know, some people are anywhere between a half hour to an hour a day. But if you want to get, you know, I would, recommend accessing some of the information on the Hubbard Protocol. A great place to do that is off of Dr. Mercola's website. So mercola.com is the general website. I've listed out here, it's a little bit, you know, I don't know if you have a pen and piece of paper, but this will be recorded and uploaded probably within the next few days. But there's actually a very interesting interview with a, a doctor by the name of Dr. Yu, who goes through the the reasons behind this protocol. You can also go to Mercola, Mercola's website and just do a general search for niacin exercise and sauna and it'll actually take you to this article. So there's not only a very detailed article listed out, but an interview that you can listen to as well. There are some other resources, you know, people often ask, well, where can I find out about how to limit these exposures and what can we do? Well, there's a number of things online. There's actually a, a woman by the name of Deborah Lynn Dad, and she's uh, Dodd, I think is her name. She's been around for quite some time, and she's written a number of books. Her latest book is called Toxic Free, and on her website she has a lot of resource links. There's a podcast, etc. So basically, she sort of dedicated herself to this. So that's a good place to start. <clears throat> well, to get a home inspection. Now, typically, if somebody's going to come out to do a home inspection, it's going to be looking for water damage and mold, etc. So if you're going to have a home inspector come out, you want to find out what is their expertise. Um, what are they testing for? Because you're really specifically looking for, are there any chemicals at home that you're being exposed to or your family's being exposed to that could be fixed and picked up by a home inspection uh, service? A number of other websites, I actually learned about this one today, I thought I'd put it here, called ToxMap. This is put out by the National Institutes of Health, by the U.S. government, and it is a map of the U.S. that will give you indications of where certain communities are being exposed to different types of toxic chemicals. And there's a bunch of links on there as well <clears throat> that you can look at too. So that was an interesting interesting website. Okay, so <clears throat> that wraps up the information on 
the, uh, the lecture material. <clears throat> I often get asked, you know, what are some good, you know, saunas out there? And, and I don't want to get into product promotion. Um, Ricola actually has some good information on his site. And, you know, he may be a little bit biased his way. We personally <clears throat> own, and I've owned it for many years, a heavenly heat sauna. And I've always, you know, I, I, I really like our sauna. Um, it's a very, you know, clean sauna, easy to put together. So, and there's, there's, there's other companies out there you just have to do your research. For those who are interested in doing further testing, we have a website called labtestplus.com where actually we have, a, you have access to the GPL talks as well as the glyphosate test and the organic acid test and some of the labs from Great Plains and others. So you can go to the menu at labtestplus.com for more information. Also, if you are a caregiver or a parent or somebody with a special needs child, I'm always available for ongoing questions and answers through the Autism Action Plan site and the what we call the Parent Forum, as well as you know, personal consulting as well. So the best email address nowadays to get in touch with my practice is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. <clears throat> My voice is about to give out. I was able to, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it there. If you did ask a few questions, you can. Those questions will be taken in by Great Plains, and then they're emailed to me. So I'll, I'll email those or respond to those emails once those questions come in. So with that, everybody, I hope everyone has a wonderful holidays as we close out 2016 with regards to these uh, complimentary webinars from Great Plains. We'll see you in 2017 with a new installment of these webinars and some more interesting information. Okay, thanks so much. Take care.